This is the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast Session Number 51, Speed Trance, with John Serbone. Welcome to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast with Jason Lynette, your professional resource for hypnosis training and outstanding business success. Here's your host, Jason Lynette. Hey, it's Jason here, and we've got a great one for you here today. Got to know John a couple of years ago by way of some products. You'll hear the wonderful moment where I give a polite jab for buying a DVD that didn't work. But then again, that's why all of us are moving away from physical products. But just all around a great guy with uh, some really cool techniques, really, really interesting thinking. You know, many of you probably know of John through his uh, speed trance style of instant inductions. Though you're going to hear a lot more, of course, of the origin story here in this recording as well as just some of his thinking about how do we approach hypnosis? How do we talk about this process? How do we interact with the public? And just really some of the power that we can bring to this stuff. What I want you to really listen to is just the passion that he brings to his work. I mean, the passion, whether it's on stage, the passion towards helping clients, you're going to hear a lot more of John here that uh, you might not have already known. So check this out. I'm going to point to some uh, links over in the show notes over at worksmarthypnosis.com. A couple of links to check out. John's personal site, hypnosisstageshow.com, as well as two different training pages you can visit as well. One of them being speedtrance.com. And then this is just a great website address to get, stagehypnosistraining.com. All the links, all the notes over at WorkSmartHypnosis.com. Check it out over there. And here we go. Session number 51, Speed Trance with John Serbone. I've been practicing forms of self-hypnosis as young as three years old, not knowing what it was. When my parents would say, hey, go pick up your room. We're about to have dinner. I'd lay down in the bed first. And then I would deep breathe and visualize moving light and energy through my body, even at that age, without anybody ever having shown me how to do that. And I've always had these weird moments where I would do things like that, where I would sort of just go into something and change my brain state. So after dinner, I'd go out to play with my friends and the kids from up and down the block, oh, I'm so tired, you know, I had to pick up my room or whatever it was, even like, you know, in later years, like seven, eight, nine years old, I'd be doing it. And I wasn't tired because I would put myself into a form of hypnosis. As I went into grammar school years, there were kids in my class that I didn't know very well. You know, just kids off to the side someplace, they were classmates, and they would approach me feeling as though I could help them in some way. So what I would do was externalize what I was doing to myself on them. And when they opened their eyes and came back from wherever they went, mentally, they felt better and didn't want to run away from home in grammar school and decided that the craziness in their family was not going to affect them the same way. And in high school and college, it was run away or commit suicide in some cases. And again, people I barely knew, people I knew by face or by name, but not really personally on a deep level. And they always felt they could help them. So they closed their eyes and go into whatever state they were in. And when they opened their eyes, they didn't want to run away or do other things that were terrible. So then when I left college, I was in the business world, in sales departments. I was selling videotape. I was selling insurance. And we had sales meetings. And occasionally, the stress levels in those jobs would be through the ceiling. And in the insurance business, they were fast-tracking me to be a sales manager. I worked for a major insurance company, a life insurance company. They filmed the movie Glen Gary, Glenn Ross, once the company moved out of that location at where I used to work. And I was watching that movie. I said, this seems really familiar. (laughs) And I was doing programs and seminars there to reduce stress and motivate salespeople. Eventually, this spilled over into the real world. And I was doing workshops, including healing circles and meditation classes. At the time, I was calling it empowerment meditation. And eventually, this started to catch on. And I would do some workshops where there'd be a handful of people and other workshops where I'd have 400 people show up, 700 people show up based on the venue and the amount of advertising that went on, I would have what I called my hippie contingent. I'd have men and women with ponytails and sleeping bags running in, laying on the floor to kind of get high for the meditation experience. And after one of the workshops where I had, I don't know, 50 or 60 people there, a guy walked up to me and said, you are one hell of a hypnotist. And jokingly, I said, a hypno what? And he said, a hypnotist. He said, you've hypnotized all these people here. Come get training. I have a training school. And I took a class with him. He had comped me into the first class. He offered me free, you know, come in, take a class with me type of thing. I went with him, and that was the first of like 40-something hypnosis certifications I currently hold. 
as it developed, I took a second class with him, which was regression hypnosis. And then from that, I started to look at hypnosis organizations and additional training and then continued to take those classes. And as I went through those things, I began to see what I thought worked and what I thought didn't work. And I started to look at how to enhance and improve this stuff. I got certified back in the late 80s to be a hypnotist. I'm still friends with some of the people from that class. But beyond that, I have continually worked to push down walls and barriers that people in training classes told me were impossible. I was told it was impossible to hypnotize somebody in fractions of a second, and I've been able to do that and come up with ways to make that work and teach other people how to do it. I was told about certain things in my stage shows, the same thing, that there are certain things you can't do in a stage show that's impossible, and I've pulled that off as well. So I've never been complacent, and I think in the world of hypnosis, there's just so much more stuff that's available to each of us to do. We're only as limited as we think we are. I want to jump back to that. What were some of the comments of things that were not possible inside of at least the stage hypnosis show? Well, I was told you couldn't pose somebody in a, as a statue standing still that could come out of hypnosis. I was told by a couple of different people that was part of it. I was told you couldn't do a speed induction to hypnotize the entire group of people who volunteer, the hypnotic committee, as it's called. And I've been able to do that. There's actually a video of me doing that in a couple of places. Even with a woman with bad eyesight issues in Chicago at the Mid-America Hypnosis Conference, the whole induction, and I was doing this with a colleague, Richard Nongard. We did a two-man show there. The whole thing took up about less than two and a half minutes to put out an entire group of people up on stage, including a woman who kept saying, what? I can't see your hands. My glasses are off. What? <laughs> and that's by today's standards, even a little slower. If I'm in a hurry, I can put people out even faster in a group. But the real speed comes from one-on-one -on -one stuff, where I've been able to be clocked at something like one-fifth of a second or one-tenth of a second. Obviously, that varies if a person is resistant or there's some other issues. But if a person is the average uh, Joe or Jane sitting down, I've been able to put them into hypnosis in incredibly fast amounts of time. It's really amazing to me when I watch the video clips, because when I'm doing this, I'm in a different place mentally. I'm in there doing the work. When I step back and I watch the video, I'm like, this is what people are freaking out about. This is the <laughs> stuff that amazes them. This is why it's... I'm like, well, that is pretty fast. And I guess if I was watching this from the audience, it would amaze me a little bit also. But there's ways to condense these things to make it work. Jumping back to when I first got trained, I was told when you read a hypnotic induction script, you mustn't miss a period, a comma, an exclamation point. If there were three dots at the end of a sentence, you have to wait like three half seconds, like dot, dot, dot in your mind if it was five of them. Oh, yeah, yeah. I was told you had pause that way. It was like some kind of magical formula that if you messed up the magic, it wouldn't work. And the reality was, no, when I started to do more and more work, I began to realize there was so much more than what I was being told by various people. So there's ways to do this stuff very quickly. There's ways to do this in a way that creates higher impact and long-lasting clinical session results when I'm working clinically. There's ways to make suggestions self-perpetuate in a clinical session, which is something I released in my new book, Power Hypnosis. What if a suggestion delivered to somebody can continue to refine and improve beyond what the initial issue was to generally improve this person's life beyond when that issue is resolved? And that's other things that I've put together since. So in a stage show, I was told, for example, there were certain things that, you know, the person would pop out of hypnosis. There's a thing I do where I'm dancing with a woman in the show who's hypnotized and I'll dip her and I'll say sleep and she faints over my arm. It's become more or less a signature piece in some of my shows. And I was told that probably wouldn't work and it does. So it's a matter of how limited are you as long as you're working safely, sanely, and in good spirit with the audience and the people who volunteer. I mean, it comes down to my, one of the favorite phrases, and this is the cleaner variation of it, which is uh, never, ever, ever use absolutes. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's so much of it that's out there. I keep falling back on the same phrase that when all else fails, apply suggestion. Right. There was an example, just a standard hand drop instant induction. I was demoing that for a recent group and someone raises his hand and he goes, yeah, but you can't do that standing, which was followed up by, okay, great. Yeah, come on up here. <laughs> and okay, you'll stand in perfect balance and alignment no matter how deeply hypnotized you become. You just apply the filters. You know, the people who would have the issue if they have the concern of people falling out of their chairs, that chair is there to support you completely. So again, I keep falling back on the same phrase that when all else fails, apply suggestion. Right. And by doing that, we find the ways to break through some of these premises that it won't work because it won't work because of this. So kind of on that note, I mean, this topic of the instant induction is one that is kind of a polarizing 
issue for some people. How do you respond to those that would say that they have no place, let's say, in a clinical environment? I think it's a silly point of view because I've used them in clinical environments. There's so many ways you can use yeah. speed induction. I've created now 53 of these. I recently came up with four for magicians, and I'm not a great card manipulator, but if you are a great card manipulator, I can teach you as a magician how to hypnotize somebody using cards <laughs> in your hand as a fixation point. So it's, again, there are ways you can use this in a clinical setting. For example, the first time I remember using this, well, for starters, the first time I came up with the butterfly induction, which is known all over the world, the Sabone butterfly induction that I created, I came up with this on the way back from a hypnosis conference, and I got detoured. Some tractor trailer had been in an accident and flipped over, and I couldn't take the road I wanted, and I was approaching Mystic, Connecticut, and this idea mystically, I guess, went through my head, and I, I pulled into a gas station convenience store and wrote it on the back of a napkin from the Wendy's restaurant chain, and a couple of days later, I tried it actually on the couch that I'm sitting on right now as I discuss this with you. And this woman keeled over on the couch with this big happy smile on her face. And I went, ooh, this is good. <laughs> but it took me about two seconds to do it. So in a clinical environment, you can use instant or speed inductions in a wide variety of different reasons. For example, what if a person comes to have them eradicate a fear of public speaking, the number one fear everybody's got? When they do the fear survey schedule, I think this year uh, death came in number four, so actually, I'm speaking in public on this podcast right now. People would rather be dead in some cases than doing what I'm doing right here. Yeah. And yet, I'd rather be in front of an audience and doing what I do. They'd rather be in the box than giving the eulogy. Right. That's exactly it. Yeah. Brilliant idea. Good concept. The point is, is that you can use it. What if a person comes to uh, have a fear of uh, public speaking eradicated through hypnosis, and they are still feeling a little trepidatious before they have to give that speech? Well, they've got 15 minutes to come in and see you and then get on the road and go give that speech. What do you do? Well, I'm not going to spend a half hour doing a verbal induction. I'm going to put my finger in their face or my fingers in their face, and I'm going to say sleep and put them back into hypnosis very fast. And then I'm going to just refortify everything I did and then ask their subconscious mind, which is one of my other techniques on the clinical end, to forgive, release, heal, and become mightier than anything that's in their mind, both known or unknown to them, and then move beyond whatever that thing is, rising above it heroically. And when I bring them back up, they're all super polished and ready to go and go out and give these speeches. And I've seen a lot of weird variations on public speaking, too. The first time I remember doing this in a large corporation was a human resource director who's now deceased years ago was telling me that she was afraid to give a speech in a room with between 14 and 25 people. If it was less than 14, she was fine. If it was more than 25, she was fine. But that window, 14 to 25 people, she had a problem with. And I just pushed her past that. I told her, first of all, there are no problems. There are merely challenges presenting themselves that are there to teach us something to rise above. And when you deflate that immediately, you've taken 80% of her problem down potentially, speaking metaphorically. And then I hypnotized her and she was able to do all of this stuff, which got me in to doing corporate programs for this very large music corporation to go in there and help them quit smoking and that kind of thing. So the doorways open up on certain levels when you produce the results. Absolutely. I'm curious to ask this, and I'm stacking my odds because I, I already know the answer. Uh, how, how much, I mean, having produced so many different inductions, having now put out several books and many DVD projects as well, how much of what you produce would come about from, let's say, let's draw that line, that, that desire to just produce content versus this came from an actual experience and now it's time to you know make it that time capsule by publishing it, whether it's a video project or a book. I only produce things that I know will be viable in the profession. There you go. I'm not big on people's rehash. I've seen too much rehash over the years, and I've improved other people's speed induction. That's not in my list of 58. That's additional things I sometimes teach in classes. But I've seen older methods where there's seven or eight or nine extra components. Would you want an additional seven or eight or nine extra components under the hood of your car? No, I wouldn't. What would they serve? No purpose at all. So the point of the matter is, if people have added additional steps in there, those steps don't need to be in there. The director, John Huston, or, uh, used to say many years ago that he would look through the camera lens and think, what needs to be here? What needs to be in front of this camera? So to me, I don't produce content just for the sake of producing content. My point is that everything I do should be one step forward further into the future of this profession. We're standing on the shoulders of giants, both known and unknown to us. There are, for example, two major names in the field of hypnosis that are now deceased individuals, Harry Ahrens and Milton Erickson. Yet I found out the name of the person who trained Harry Ahrens. And that's not even mentioned on Wikipedia or any place on the Internet. Nobody knows who this man is. 
He was a doctor from Germany named Peter Gottenmeier, and he's not even mentioned any place. And then again, if that's the case, who trained him? Right. And that's also, I mean, if he's pretty much forgotten, and I only know about him because a woman I know took a class with him or took a series of classes with him to get trained initially. She's around longer than I am as a person on the planet, whatever. So the point is, is that who trained this man? So we're standing on legendary figures, you know, and just as you wouldn't be necessarily driving a car from the 1950s. I recently saw a television show about Havana, Cuba, where they have all these old antique cars. They keep them running because they kind of had to. But in other countries where they have up-to-date cars, you're not driving something that's 50, 60, 70 years old, generally, unless you own an antique car, because you want something with airbags and a stereo and air conditioning and different things. Well, it's the same thing with the techniques we're using. I find way too often we're stuck in the past doing things of the past. And I think if all of us in the profession as trained hypnotists, as professional hypnotists, as certified hypnotists, or whatever term you're using as a hypnotist, thought three steps down the road, I think all of this would evolve up with all of us thinking, what's the next phase in the evolution of this stuff? And that's really what all my stuff is about. I'm looking to evolve my stage shows to make them more like a rock concert. I'm looking to make the inductions mind-blowingly fast and irrefutably provable to the people who've been hypnotized and to the audience watching me hypnotize these people. You know, and even with the clinical work, I want the sessions to work in high dynamic impact in these people's lives. But if I get somebody to quit smoking, who has been smoking 20, 30, 40, 50 years of cigarettes, two and three and four and five packs a day in some cases, and I get them to quit in one session permanently, then we're doing something high impact. And we're doing something that I was told in the earlier days, no, you've got to do X amount of sessions for this person. No, you don't. The idea is get in there and do the work. Do extra people, some other people on the side need extra sessions? Absolutely. Do other people need multiple sessions for reinforcement? Often they do. But many people have come in here, I need to stop this immediately. I have to have an operation tomorrow or three days from now or something or a week from now. I have to get off these cigarettes. But what are you going to do about that? What you're going to do is take this to a higher level, each of us. So the way I've always lived my life is the greater the challenge, the mightier I bounce back, the mightier I become. And I think that's a modicum of how I speak about doing this stuff or dealing with these issues, that the harder I get hit, the harder I come back. And that's, I think, something that is basically the foundation of where I'm coming from, at least in one portion of the foundation of where I'm coming from. Yeah, it's that pattern, though, of rather than content for content's sake, actually having things that are tested, having things that have been workshopped. And I, I always flash back, how many inductions is it again? 58 so far. I'm not done yet. <laughs> exactly. And I've seen you do many of them, and I always flash to the... Uh, it's an old joke about, I can make you any balloon animal you want. It's going to look like a dog, though. When, when you hear us, they're very different <laughs> in style. There's different applications. They're right. sanding it down to the essentials. I think that's a huge theme that needs to be highlighted here, that far too often I find that people are publishing and rehashing things as improvements. And sometimes these improvements are doing either one of two things. They're either adding something to it to make it different enough, they can slap their name on it, or perhaps they're modifying for even just one time that it went wrong. And because it went wrong that one time, they then modify for everybody from that point forward. And you end up with a technique that's 10 minutes longer than it needs to be and doesn't work as well as it used to. Well, I get people when they buy my books that are kind of astounded. They're like, is this old original content? I said, I've written every word in the book except the testimonials. That would just be morally wrong. <laughs> so other people put the testimonials. But other than that, having somebody proofread the book or copy edit the book, I just went through this most recent book with a very detailed oriented copy editor. She did an amazing job, but there was a lot of work involved in that. You know, other than that, every word that's in there is my own. And some people get the book and they're like, there's nothing here I've ever seen anywhere else before. I'm like, yeah. Well, every other book that was like this that I bought had somebody else's technique in there. I'm like, well, that's not what I do. And that's not what I'm known for. And that's not what I want to be known for. I want to be the guy that if you contact me with something, I have a unique approach to this. And maybe a new insight. And maybe my new insight will be taken by 10 other people after me. And at some point, they'll look at this, you know, long after I'm you know, sitting on a cloud someplace playing a harp, <laughs> possibly, and saying, this stuff sparked this other stuff that we're doing now. And without this, we couldn't be here. And I think it's like putting up a skyscraper. I think every brick or pane of glass or girder that you put in is going to build something immense and powerful. And I think that potential is there within each of us. I used to have this discussion years ago with the late, great Orman McGill, who was a friend and a bit of a mentor to me at times when I needed somebody to speak to about certain things. And one of the kindest, most decent human beings who's ever walked the planet. It's just a golden human being. I mean, his presence on this earth made it a better place. 
And he used to say to me, you think the same way I do. We used to have these discussions. And it's a matter of one of the things I put in my book in a discussion I had with Norman years ago, which is what is your intent? What is the intent that you're bringing to what you're doing? Well, if it's a speed induction, I'm moving them forward milliseconds in time to get them hypnotized and put them into hypnosis in a way that's irrefutable in most cases. You know, once in a while, you're going to get somebody, no matter what you do, you know, their hair could be on fire. They'd be like, no, it's not on fire. But the point is, is that to do things that nobody's thought to do before, maybe Star Trek to boldly go where no one's gone before, you know? <laughs> But the stage shows, it should be some kind of an entertainment experience, not just some hypnotist standing on the side of the stage, the way it's been done for 50, 60, or 100, or 200 years, 300 years of stage work, where people are just standing on the side of the stage and, you know, putting out a weaker performance. You know, we live in a rock and rap culture where the events that are on stage are bigger than life. Hypnosis shows should be bigger than life. And to stand on the side and kind of mutter through certain things, or I've also seen people performing that laugh, you know, in a way that's not genuine. Disingenuous laughter is not conducive to the audience's actual genetic laughter, ge generic laughter, or whatever the word is I'm looking for here. You know, genuine laughter. So the idea is to get out there and do things. The same thing with the clinical work that I do, for sessions, for corporations. Get out there and do stuff that's high impact. I recently did a show right in the, at the end of my grad season where I had a show that ended at 4.30 in the morning for a high school for these project graduation shows and then got in the car and drove to Connecticut and did a show for a major insurance company that same night at the quarter to seven. So I left one venue at 4.30 in the morning, drove for three hours to a hotel, slept, got up at 2.30 in the afternoon and banged out a hit show for them starting at a quarter to seven. And the woman who was the entertainment planner walked up to me and said to me, I've seen other hypnotists do shows before. You've absolutely blown my mind. You put them out fast. The routines were punchy and that bang, bang, bang. You hit us. As soon as we stopped laughing, there was more laughter following it. And it was nonstop entertainment until you got finished. And I said, that's what I do. And she said, you'll be seeing me again. And I said to her, I'm going to hold you to that. And she said, no, 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 count on it. Mm. I will definitely be hiring you again because I'm seeing an energy that you put into this show that I don't always see other performers bring. And the question is, if you're doing these shows, where is that energy level within you? You need to have the inner performer within you unleashed and go out there and do this. If you're going to be a performer, perform and blow our socks off. <clears throat> if you're going to be a hypnotist, go out there and hypnotize like nobody's ever done it before. Take everything to the next level. And that's really what my whole deal here is. I love it. I love it. So how do you respond to, I mean, it's the history of this stuff, but when people would say that, oh, the stage hypnosis is not good for us anymore, it's, it's taking us back a step. I think you've already hit those points, but I mean, how would you respond to those folks that are out there that are a little on the anti-stage hip side? The way I look at it is this. My stage work makes my clinical sessions better. Yes. My clinical work makes my stage hypnosis better. And for starters, with the idea that you postulated here, when I've raised $195,000 to help fight children's cancer in one night through a stage show in a wealthy area, you know, what is that doing about bringing us backwards in some way? Beautiful. I'm bringing money to children who need this that are dying of cancer. You know, there's other diseases I've worked against also, you know, in terms of fundraising event money and stuff given to hospitals, given directly to families that were up against it with kids that needed rare drugs and unusual treatments and this sort of thing. So by itself, on its own, you can't put a price on the work that we're doing here. The price that you put on this stuff is just, I mean, it's the same thing with the clinical work that we do as well. The clinical work that we do as well is the same idea. But the clinical work, if I can get somebody to quit smoking cigarettes and that single parent, for example, or that single grandparent is there to dance at that child's wedding, you can't put a price on what we're doing. It's just incredible. In terms of the stage work, as long as the people are handled properly and you're not doing anything that's going to be detrimental to them or offensive to them or disrespectful to them in some way, there's no reason you can't have a good laugh and have a good show. And at the end of every one of my shows, I personally empower everybody who volunteered to come up. I will give them a nine-hour nap. I'll give them a seven-hour back rub. I'll inspire them to be free of procrastination and to live a better dream in their life. All the things that they've been standing in front of themselves and stopping is something that I will get them to move forward from and seize the moment. And that's my way of saying thank you. So I think, you know, considering also to one other point as I'm thinking about it, stage hypnosis kept clinical hypnosis alive. Yes. So without stage hypnosis, there wouldn't be modern-day clinical hypnosis. Further, Freud started off as a hypnotist and then decided he had his own take on things and took hypnotic concepts, if you actually look at some of the stuff he started off with, and made them into what he did. Yet, towards the end of his life, he decided, no, all this stuff I've been teaching all along is incorrect, let's do this other stuff, and then he passed on. But I often wonder if Freud hadn't twisted hypnosis around what the actual therapeutic model these days would actually look like. 
because so much of what's going on in someone's head is subconscious. 90 to 94% of what we're doing is subconscious behavior, automatic behavior, things we're doing, we don't know why we're doing it. The average person, if you speak to them, thinks we're all little Mr. Spocks working around logical every minute. But the reality is, is no, we're not. We're all on automatic pilot. And most of the stuff we're doing, we don't know why we're doing it. It's something we picked up. It's some way we go about it. The way you drive home from work, for example. Why do you go that way versus another way? I know people who sit in traffic. Well, that's the way I go home every night. Well, then take a different road. You know, and that's kind of what we were doing here as hypnotists. We're telling them to take a different road. We're showing them there is a different road, and they can get on the road and get where they need to go in a way that's going to support them physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, better harmony in their lives, their workplace, their family, their relationships. There's so much that we do. The most difficult thing I think any hypnotist has to overcome is the fear of hypnosis that people have. The two top-selling books in the 1800s was Dracula, which is all about hypnosis when you think about it. I mean, let's face it, <laughs> The Count, Transylvania, Look Into My Eyes, Eye Fixation, or Svengali and Trilby, which is this evil man was hypnotizing this singer to be his like love slave or whatever it was, and he wasn't, he wasn't a nice guy. So since the 1800s, this is stored in people's consciousness that hypnosis is some kind of strange thing. It's used in movies and TV shows incorrectly all the time as well. So the point is, is that we have to overcome this stigma from the 1800s. But once you do, there's just so much stuff that can be done with this. And the stage shows are fun, and it's a good time for everybody. And again, I've used a lot of my stage work to help fight diseases for children and adults alike and to support people you know, in these fights against these illnesses and that sort of thing. I love doing charity fundraising work. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And I want to mention a couple of websites here, uh, three of yours. There's uh, your main site, which is uh, hypnosisstageshow.com, correct? Yes. There's everything from stage work on there to clinical work to my books and a lot of other product MP3s. Everything that I do is in that site, including a blog and videos, my YouTube page. I uh, recently broken 1.6 million hits on YouTube. So that's something if you like YouTube. That's nice, yeah. And I'll put the links to all these in the show notes as well, as well as two training pages, speedtrance.com and stagehypnosistraining.com. That's impressive. You all got that one. Well, with the speed inductions, you can learn how to speed hypnotize. If you can't make it to my classes, I've got one coming up here in October. But if you're interested, take a look at those sites. You can learn what I'm able to teach you via the internet now. Back in the 90s and 2000s, I was sending out a lot of DVDs, and there was problems with them going overseas, getting destroyed, disappearing, getting stuck in customs. And now with the Internet and the way we're able to do things, those sites are instant downloads, and you can take a look at a wide variety of things. All of those websites have updates, and there's videos to watch. Uh, the two later sites are also member pages that you can join for continual updates and video upgrades. I recently just shot how to do a 20-minute stage hypnosis show. I did two of them as we shot that within a two-hour period and explained how to do a 20-minute hypnosis show. Oh, that's because cool. it's a common question I got right across the board from people in a wide variety of areas. How come you can't do a short show? Well, I do them. And I've been thrust into situations in the past years that made me do them. A media mogul hired me. He's a guest judge on American Idol. And he said to me, come in and do a short show. So I did a short show. So the bottom line is, is that I think we're only as limited as we believe we are. No, John, you need at least 75 minutes to pull it off. Right. Well, <laughs> I love what you said about the membership forum, the format of that, because I can remember, I forget the guys who put this out there, but I got this two DVD set called Skits and Bits, and my second DVD didn't work. Well, I hope, I hope those guys replaced it for you free of charge, right? <laughs> they did. Yeah, that, they did. They did good. They're good people. That would be a product that we released. It's also one, I believe that's actually also uploaded to stagehypnosistraining.com. Yeah, so that's the cool thing about the, the flexible format and the, the information on demand. I just love that. So I'll put the links to all those pages over on uh, worksmarthypnosis.com. Thank you. To kind of wrap things up, I want to ask you a question here, kind of throw you on the spot for a moment, but I'm sure you'd have something for this. Can you think of a moment that happened perhaps in a stage show that just simply surprised you, that something took a different turn and just a unique experience to share? Yeah, there's a lot of those. Those are the ones that make me laugh the hardest. I love those moments. I had a, a bit where a dog was licking your face, and I had gotten hired to do this show while I was in Manhattan, sitting down with a female who I had trained to be a stage hypnotist. And on the way back in traffic coming out of Manhattan, just after rush hour, I get a phone call, what are you doing tomorrow morning? So I had to drive. I was home 20 minutes to pack a bag, get a contract, book a hotel room, and then drive to Massachusetts from New York City. And I go up there, and it's a big hullabaloo going to do the show. And... I had this thing that I had written called The Dog is Looking Your Face, like a giant sheepdog that loves you. And we all kind of make that face. 
the three young ladies in the middle, without my suggesting it, started licking the dog back. <laughs> and I had three pretty ladies in the middle of the show licking the dog's face back. I, I was doubled over crying. There was tears <laughs> running down my face. I was laughing so hard. The audience was doing exactly the same thing I was. And there's other moments, too. I remember I was doing a show in front of about 5,000 people at a um, college in Pennsylvania. They were having a uh, bring the high school students in to take a look at the campus and get them to come here type of thing. And there was all these long-distance buses out, and I mean, dozens and dozens of them out, maybe hundreds of them out in the parking lot. And I'm five routines off the end of the show. And this one young man in hypnosis opens his eyes, and his eyes are fluttering like crazy, even though they're open. And he just goes stage left, I mean, walks away. So I said, sleep, because what else would you do? And they all went out, and... I ran backstage, and there's this hush came over the audience. I heard this, like, where did he go? You know, this gasp. And I ran backstage, and at the risk of being slightly crude here, he was about to relieve himself to a degree on the wall. He was setting himself up to do that. And I grabbed him by his left arm because he seemed to be right-handed because I'm not stupid. <laughs> and, and, I, and I said to him, uh, freeze, what are you doing? He said, dude, I really got to go. I said, you're closing your pants. You're running to the men's room, getting there just in time. You're feeling wide awake on the count of three, one, two, three. Run to the men's room. So he ran to the men's room, and as I walked out on stage, there was all these people in the audience, just dead quiet, this huge theater with a big balcony. And I just walked out, I put my chin down towards my chest, and I looked up at the audience after a couple of seconds of pause, and I said, he had to pee. And the place went berserk, <laughs> just laughing, you know? There's been a lot of those moments. I did a show one time for an East Indian family at, in New Jersey, and it was pouring rain. And during the induction, it started raining again. It was an outdoor show. And I got soaked right through my socks and my underwear, squishing in my shoes. And I kept the show going. They were running under a tent to watch the show, but these people were getting soaked themselves. And after the show, a rainbow appeared behind us. My people were like left and right, and I was standing on the stage right side, even though it wasn't a stage really. And these people were reverently kneeling down and touching my toe with their finger, thinking I was able to make a rainbow happen. So if I could make rainbows, that would be something else I'd put on the internet, I suppose. But... There's been a lot of really amazing and fun stuff that's happened in my shows, and those are the things that make the shows the best that they can be for me on a personal level for myself because if I laugh during the show, I don't know any other career you could have where you walk out a hero, you do the show and perform it well, you walk off a bigger hero, plus you get paid. And I think that's a really astounding position to be in as a performer and as somebody who does this for a living. Thanks for listening to the Work Smart Hypnosis Podcast at WorkSmartHypnosis.com. Hey, it's Jason, and I just want to thank you once again for listening to this program and just ask a couple of small favors. Let us know what you think. Head over to the iTunes listing for WorkSmartHypnosis.com and leave your feedback. It's your feedback that helps us to grow this program, helps us to get great guests on here like uh, John Serbone and many others as well. Along with that too, I'd encourage you to head over to HypnosisBusinessBootCamp.com. You know, because when we talk about growing our hypnosis business, of course, you need to become a really good hypnotist to get those results. Yet at the same time, the way that you really get those results is by getting out there, working with clients and producing that solid business so people can find you. You know, this is a common theme that pops up inside of this program. People talking about not just their technique, but also how to get those people in the door. So Hypnosis Business Bootcamp is the entire roadmap behind how I built my own six-figure hypnosis business. Whether it's seeing clients, whether it's selling seats for classes or producing products, basically it's the entire brain dump of everything that I've done for my business packaged together in a system that you can purchase for, honestly, less than what you should be making from one single client. And then, of course, you get to use the system over and over and over. And, of course, there's a 30-day 100% satisfaction guarantee. If you don't like the tie that I'm wearing, you can get a refund. Although, it's the old classic purple tie that I've had to retire for various reasons. Uh, so check that out, hypnosisbusinessbootcamp.com. Get out there, grow your hypnosis business, do great work, and just be a good person, too. I'll see you next time. Hey there, it's Jason, and I want you to be one of the first to find out as we upload amazing new content. So do this right now. Click the subscribe button right here on this video. That's going to link you to our YouTube channel here, and you will be the first to find out as new resources and downloads are made available. Do it now.